Coming up on We Talk News this week, another worker for another MSO dies while on the job inside a Grove facility. Plus, Philip Morris buys an Israeli cannabis company for a deal up to $650 million. Is big tobacco ready to absorb another crop? And New York finds an illegal cannabis operation in 11 locations over $400,000. Is that enough to stop selling it? And Safe Banking picks up more senator support as Safe Banking moves closer to a vote. Plus, a New Mexico legal dispensary gets shut down for selling imported California weed. And Wiz Khalifa's Kush comes to the Bay State as Cresco Labs teams up with another celebrity. Is it worth it? Plus, coast to coast, cannabis coverage on We Talk News with Elena Pinto, next. We are pro-cannabis media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of Weed Talk News. I'm Elena Pinto. In January last year, an employee of True Leaf Grow facility in Massachusetts died after respiratory failure on the job. Now, another employee dies also on on the job, and this time in Illinois at GTI, or Green Thumb Industries, based in Chicago. GTI was quick to put out a release that natural causes were listed as cause of death. Now, a new report out of Illinois said the 60-year-old female employee had COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. The worker identified as Julie McKinney had been working part-time in that facility run by Green Thumb Industries for three years. Over that time, the fire department has regularly been called when she had shortness of breath. Well, this time it was fatal. New York State continues to battle the illegal sale of cannabis in stories in the city. And now Rami Alzandani, the owner of 11 convenience stores, has to pay back taxes and over $400,000 in fines. Four of his stores pleaded guilty to possession and unlicensed sales and paid $5,000 in fines. With more on what is going on in New York, here's Pam Schmiel. I'm Pam Schmiel, host of the Mary Jane Society podcast with the New York Cannabis Report for We Talk News. Is New York finally making some headway in moving their cannabis industry forward? Yesterday, regulators granted licenses to another 212 social equity entrepreneurs, bringing the number of approved dispensaries to close to 400. And applications for the general public should be released by September, according to the Office of Cannabis Management. And that should really get the ball rolling. And lawmakers also approved the sale of cannabis flower at pop-up events like farmers markets, concerts, festivals, and fairs to help farmers unload their overstock of cannabis. And finally, the New York City District Attorney, Alvin Bragg, known for being very light on crime, has initiated an all-out war with landlords to evict illegal pot shops. That's this week's news. I'm Pam Schmiel for the New York Cannabis Report for We Talk News. Okay, here we go again. Is there hope for safe banking? This is the bill that has been passed in some form by the House seven times in the last few years. Now it looks like there are nine GOP senators ready to cross over and support the bill in the U.S. Senate. For more on that development in Washington, D.C., here's Andrew Beringer. Reporting from Washington, D.C., this is Andrew Beringer for We Talk News. Just a quick update on the Safe Banking Act at the federal level. The Safe Banking Act, which is a crucial piece of legislation aimed at ensuring a secure banking environment for the cannabis industry, remains in the committee stage as both political parties engage in discussions to bring it to a vote. Unfortunately, we have just found out that the Safe Banking Act will most likely not be brought up for a committee vote before the end of the session on July 31st. Now, what does this mean? It means that we have to put a pause into everything we're trying to do for the Safe Banking Act. 
despite our hopes and our dreams of passing it within the next couple of weeks. You will have to tune in to see what their updates are. Reporting from Washington, D.C., this is Andrew Berenger for Wheat Talk News. Kira Leaf is laying off 49 workers in New Jersey because that nascent industry is growing more wheat in that state than is being sold. So this is a similar tale in many states causing an overabundance of cannabis that is landlocked in each state because of its federal illegal status. So with more from New Jersey, here's Jill Goldsbury. Hey guys, what's going on? It's Jill Goldsbury here with We Talk News New Jersey and here is the New Jersey report. Cura Leaf, the largest multi-state operator in the U.S. based in New York, has 5,000 plus employees. Cura Leaf announced this week that they are actually laying off 49 employees from their Winslow, New Jersey cultivation and production facility. According to Cura Leaf CEO Matt Darren, New Jersey with just 35 legal adult use dispensaries, there aren't enough dispensaries in New Jersey to maintain the current product at the Winslow location. So uh, Darren said that they hope to reopen in the future, but depends on the number of cannabis regulatory commission approved new openings. In other news, back in June, I reported that the Cannabis Regulatory Commission voted to give applicants with prior convictions for cannabis offenses exclusivity in access to wholesale distribution and delivery service licenses for one year. Well, in a surprising change, New Jersey regulators have significantly amended plans to give social equity applicants the first shot at establishing their cannabis businesses. On Tuesday of this week, the commission voted to dramatically reduce the period to three months with cannabis businesses owned by women, minorities, and veterans getting the priority for the following three months. Uh, Chairman Diane Hueno stated that I think this is well-intentioned, but not quite hitting the mark. And lastly, on a lighter note, if you're excited about all the Barbie themed festivities coming up in the next week, well, you might want to put on your best Barbie gear and head on over to Popped NYC. That's at Popped NYC uh, space. They're working with at Pretty Tokers to produce this dress up Barbie dress up event to get ready for the big Barbie dress up contest hosted by High Garden NYC. It's the Out the Plastic Rooftop Rendezvous hosted by Tribe Tokes. And um, maybe Barbie did tote a little bit back in the day. You never know. Anyway, I'm Jill Goldsberry with We Talk News New Jersey. Thanks for watching. See you next week. A New Mexico dispensary tried to create its own interstate commerce by selling cannabis obtained from California and has been shut down. Keep in mind that 80% of the illegal legacy market is grown in that golden state and shipped illegally over the USA. This fact has been one of the drivers toward legalization and state agreements for interstate commerce. Well, an Albuquerque dispensary was shut down for violating the New Mexico law on the legal sale of cannabis. And upon inspection, compliance officers found no record of products for $65,000 in sales of products with California labeling and packaging. It is the first time New Mexico authorities has shut down a dispensary for violations since legalization in 2022. That state market has sold over $300 million of weed in its first year of operation. California continues to be the largest cannabis market in the country, and Lavanna Vassal has our California report. I'm Lavanna Vassal reporting for PCM with this week's California report for Weed Talk News. Summertime in California means festival season, and on July 14th through the 16th, the Northern Nights Music Festival took place for its 10th year in the heart of Northern California's Emerald Triangle. In 2019, Northern Nights was the first music festival in the country to have legal on-site cannabis sales and consumption. And in 2022, it was the first music festival to have dispensaries located at stages and to have multiple on-site dispensaries. Now in 2023, Northern Nights has leveled up the cannabis festival experience once again by becoming the music first music festival to create its own 
own in-house cannabis cultivar. Following a multi-year process of pheno hunting, Northern Knights had seeds available on site for both personal and commercial sales, along with flowers of the cultivar available for sampling. Created in collaboration with world-renowned local legacy family breeders, Humboldt Seed Company, the new Northern Knights strain relies on proprietary genetics. This year, the festival also incorporated cannabis vending into the venue footprint itself. Fulfillment via the Weed Maps platform and designated purchase pickup zones enabled open sales throughout the event, creating a new model that reimagines how cannabis sales can be merged into the festival experience. There were festival-wide cannabis experiences curated by Absolute Extracts, Farmer and the Felon, Arcata Fire, Ridgeline Farms, Madrone, Boonville Farm, and more local licensed cannabis legacy companies. With the world getting back into the full swing of things, it's a beautiful thing to see the still new cannabis hospitality industry in California finally beginning to blossom. That's this week's California Cannabis Report. I'm Lavana Vassa from PCM reporting for Weed Talk News. The state of Ohio has a fledgling medical cannabis market and the battle for legalization begins. First, the Ohio Medical Board made some controversial changes to qualifying diagnoses. This week, they took autism and OCD or obsessive compulsive behavior off the list of qualifying conditions. The Ohio Medical Board did add irritable bowel syndrome to the list of qualifying conditions to uh, receive your medical marijuana card. So now let's check in with Brendan Jones, our man in Missouri. Hey, everybody. It's Brandon Jones from Big Read Distribution with the Missouri Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. And yeah, Missouri is going crazy right now. Over $4 million in sales on average per day here in the state now. June was another record-selling month. It's been very crazy to see the market take off and just not plateau, but continue to increase. So we're very excited for the sales here. Over 16,000 jobs have been created by the cannabis market. So we're very, very excited to see the new people getting, you know, actually have an income here. We're seeing some more social equity happening here and more uh, minority owners are getting ready to come into the state. So that's also a great thing. We're seeing that happen. Events are going crazy right now. So we have the Missouri Growers Cup in September. We have the Major Cannabis Expo. Today, I built a doghouse out of hempcrete. And, and last week, I was hanging out with the Yin Yang Twins. So no matter what kind of culture you want to be a part of, whether it's educational or fun, recreational, we've got it all for you here in the state of Missouri. So Again, I'm Brandon Jones with Be Green Distribution with Missouri Cannabis Support for We Talk News. Everybody stay educated and medicated. Have a great week. Brandon Jones, Missouri Cannabis Report is brought to you by Baker Brands, a curated B2B marketplace for head shops and dispensaries. Now it's time to check on the publicly traded cannabis stocks with Doug Miller from High on Wall Street. I'm Doug Miller from High on Wall Street with this week's cannabis stock report for Weed Talk News. In New Jersey news, workers at Cannabis approved a contract with a labor union. This dispensary is owned by an MSO, Columbia Care, and is their first unionized workplace. The union did not provide contract details aside from noting guaranteed wage increases retroactive to March of this year. Also in New Jersey news, Cureleaf is laying off 49 workers at one of its production facilities. It also hopes to be the next MSO to join the TSX, that's the Toronto Stock Exchange. The company wishes to implement a reorganization of its U.S. cannabis assets according to the filing. Let's look at the stock chart because I mentioned before when it was around 250, it would pop out of the basement and it did. It ran to about 420 and now I'm watching for it to pull back. And that's this week's cannabis stock report reporting for Weed Talk News. I'm Doug Miller. The price of a pound of cannabis varies from state to state since every legal state has its own set of rules and regulations, but there is a wholesale index. Cannabis Benchmarks put out a report this week comparing prices, and believe it or not, despite the doom and gloom from the industry, the price is going up from last year. Benchmarks reports that $1,020 per pound is the average price, which is up from $988 in December, which is an increase of 3.1%. You'll never guess where the most expensive wholesale price for a pound of cannabis is. 
in Washington, D.C. Yes, it's still illegal to sell in our nation's capital. But now that Maryland is legal, guess where all that tax revenue is going? To Maryland, of course. The East is catching up to the West. In Washington State, though, Matt Friedlander is our correspondent there. And here's his report for this week. Hello all, Matthew Friedlander coming to you from the owner's office here at Skagit Organics with the Washington State Cannabis Report for We Talk News. So the LCB has some open rule changes. Uh, they are open for public commentary at the moment, uh, most notably rules surrounding the Department of Health Medical Cannabis Program. And there are rules surrounding a new bill that was passed that will be restricting the importation of CBD and hemp products into our regulated market. In 2016, the LCB passed a law that allowed the importation of CBD and hemp into our recreational market, and now they seem to be reversing course. Uh, there's also rumblings that the LCB uh, is looking at implementing a new traceability system. Uh, so this should be fun for everyone involved as the three previous attempts to do this have been uh, complete disasters and at one point shut down the entire industry from being able to do transactions uh, for about two weeks. Uh, on the continuing uh, legislative and, and legalization front, um, even here in Washington, it is still a felony to grow a single plant of cannabis, even though we have a recreational legal cannabis market here. And one group continues to step up to try to get this passed, and that is the Cannabis Alliance. Uh, they will be hosting a march and rally uh, sometime in August or September, so be on the lookout for details uh, uh, for that event. Uh, that's what I got for you. Uh, Matthew Friedlander signing off for We Talk News. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Things aren't much better in Washington's neighboring state of Oregon. For some reason, many cannabis companies decide that paying taxes is an optional activity. Obviously, they haven't heard the saying that the only two guarantees in life is death and taxes. Marianne Krasaji from Oregon reports on just how much is missing from her state and what they are doing about it. I'm Marianne from Alibi with this week's Oregon Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. This week, Oregon's Department of Revenue released a list of taxpayers who owe over $50,000. Unsurprisingly, the list includes a large number of cannabis companies. American Patriot Brands owes over $27 million. This cannabis company is also under investigation from the SEC for fraud. Cannabis licensees also now need to demonstrate tax compliance to renew their license. This will likely lead to a number of cannabis companies surrendering their license. And next, the fallout from testing changes earlier this year continues to grow. Rumors in the industry are that more flour and trim is going to processing because of the difficulty of passing the new aspergillus testing requirements. Oregon's rules are out of step with other states and the industry is lobbying for changes. Finally, Cheechable's Summer Sesh is happening next weekend, so grab your tickets before they're sold out. See you there. That'll do it for the Oregon Report this week. I'm Marianne with Alibi for Weed Talk News. You might remember when Vermont passed adult use legalization in 2018, becoming the 11th state to legalize cannabis sales. And at the time, they were the first to get this done through a legislative initiative. So now there are 23 legal states in the U.S. with a majority using a ballot question to move forward. That initiative in Florida is now under attack by their attorney general. The Sunshine State has a vibrant medical market with close to 1 million registered patients. This week, however, a member of the state chamber of commerce has come out in opposition to the ballot question that is currently under attack by their attorney general. So maybe they should follow Vermont's example. The floods, though, have finally subsided there, and Jesse Lynn Dolan has our Vermont report sponsored by Canatrol. I'm Jesse Lynn Dolan from Vermont Cannabis Nurses, and this is the Weed Talk News Vermont Report. Vermont continues to see heavy rain and flash flooding, damaging crops and facilities statewide. 
though many counties have been declared a national major disaster, making government funds and FEMA available for businesses, cannabis licensees are not eligible for any support. The Vermont Cannabis Control Board approved 42 licenses this past week, 38 of them cultivating licenses. Unfortunately, they also voted to ban all temperature sensitive cannabis products that need refrigeration, removing a dozen products from the market that have already been on the shelves for sale at retailers. That's the Vermont Report for Weed Talk News. I'm Vermont's cannabis nurse, Jessie Lynn Dolan. The Vermont Cannabis Report is supported by another Green Mountain business, Canatrol, winner of High Times Best Dry Cure System. Check them out at canatrolls.com. I'm Angie Seifert from Skip Intro Advisors with the Connecticut Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. Shangri La Dispensaries is slated to break ground on its first retail dispensary in Norwalk, and it is now also seeking to open a second location that would offer a drive through for customers. The proposed two story drive through would share an address with a new apartment complex. If approved and built, the location will be the third and last cannabis dispensary in the city. Drive through dispensaries in a new state? Talk about innovation and differentiation. Lorraine CT, which is operated by Zaina Francis, is seeking the town's approval to open a 3,700 square foot facility to be used to bake edibles, including gummies, other snacks, and THC infused beverages. The single story brick warehouse building was previously home to the Fairfield Craft Ales, a brewery that opened in 16 but closed last fall. Clearly, we are utilizing every square foot of real estate in this small state. Finally, the Stanford Zoning Board unanimously passed a new regulation that also affects cannabis dispensaries. The new rule would prohibit smoke shops and dispensaries from operating within 3,000 square feet of any other such store or within 1,000 square feet of a public or non-public school. It also limits Stanford to one cannabis retailer for every 25,000 residents, effectively capping the city at five dispensaries. So Stanford is looking not to overcrowd the city or be within the school zone. I'm Angie Seifert from Skip Intro Advisors with the Connecticut Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. There's some progressive reform news from the state of Michigan this week. THC testing for pre-employment for state jobs has been waived by the state civil service commission. Federal employees still have to provide a pre-employment test result and state police will also have to be tested. However, any Michigan business who suspects someone is under the influence can ask that employee to take a test. Every state has different laws and that includes Massachusetts. And that's where our PCM founder, Jimmy Young is from, and he has the Bay State Cannabis Report. Thanks, Elena. I'm PCM founder, Jimmy Young, and this is the Bay State Cannabis Report sponsored by CNA Stores. So when is a record not a record? When the record is wrong. Last week, we reported that Massachusetts had a record $132 million in sales for the month of June. As it turns out, that total was $151 million combined adult and medical sales, and that total was the seventh largest. It was a record for the year so far. Many national cannabis media reports picked up the story and took the word of the Cannabis Control Commission public documents. Intrepid reporter Chris Ferrone from the Talking Joints Memo was on Green Rush Live last week, and he explains how this can happen. You know, I'm not here to really turn on all these other outlets, but when I saw that it was the best month, I was a little surprised. So I started looking back and I, you know, of course, once something is reported, it just gets repeated and repeated and repeated. Um, so I did go and I found one or two months that had been slightly higher. You know, this really isn't a big deal. You know, it's one of those things, but it, it does go to show that with cannabis media, one thing, you know, for me, the repetition, the, the aggregation without fact checking, that's a little bothersome. The Cannabis Control Commission is also taking heat from the testing labs about their inspection process. Michael Kahn, CEO of MCR Labs, said, quote, CCC enforcement staff may be misusing investigations 
as a pretext to silence and harass licensees. Now, add in the fact that testing labs dictate the amount of THC and other cannabinoids and terpenes in the flower, getting tough inspections has to be part of the legal process. I mean, doesn't it? That's this week's Bay State Cannabis Report, sponsored by CNA Stores. I'm PCM founder Jimmy Young reporting for We Talk News. The Bay State Cannabis Report is sponsored by CNA Stores, a veteran-owned and family-operated dispensary in Amesbury and Haverhill that has the best selection in the state and a dedication to the community north of Boston. And finally, celebrity endorsements of cannabis is a marketing tactic that many manufacturers of weed derivatives use to spur sales. Well, in Cannabis.net's weekly newsletter this week, Kurt Dalton explains that practice is not necessarily the case because the facts just don't bear that out. He says it's all about the price. It also hasn't stopped the practice. This week, Cresco Labs has added Grammy and Golden Globe Award nominee Wiz Khalifa and his Khalifa Kush strain to its menu. His brand KK and Khalifa Mints are now available at Sunnyside Cresco Labs Dispensary in Framingham, Fall River, Worcester, and Leicester locations. The other thing that Kurt pointed out was that these celebrity brands tend to be less expensive than other comparable products. That alone makes them more popular. There you go. Oh, those cities, those towns that I just named, they're all in Massachusetts. And that's it for Weed Talk News this week. I'm Elena Pinto. And remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. Oh. cultivation through to consumption lifestyle brand for the cannabis industry. Of course, the crown jewel in our product line is the Armoire home grow system. So now with Green Goddess Supply, we can take you everywhere from growing it in the Armoire right through to storing it, consuming it, rolling it, storing it, you name it, A to Z. Our goal is to enable everybody and anybody anywhere to be able to produce their own organic flower quickly, easily, discreetly, and inexpensively. You would think that it is. However, there's quite a bit of debate right now in the accounting industry when it relates to cannabis with this exact question. Um, I'm part of a few different networking groups that are solely accountants for cannabis companies. And there's been quite a bit of back and forth in those communities and discussion regarding whether 280E, if it went away, if, if the administration legalized cannabis or took it off of schedule one what would happen and it could go either way right now the debate is it can make the accountant's life much easier uh, that's what a lot of the inexperienced accountants are saying right now it seems whereas the accountants that have been in this industry for a while and have, and have gone through the same thing that happened with hemp a few years ago are saying that it'll actually will make lives more difficult because when hemp became declassified a while back, the accounting became more complicated. Sativa Labs in Westfield is fast becoming the number one testing lab for cannabis in Western Massachusetts. Safetiva understands the importance for accurate on-time test results for your product. That's why their current compliance panel turnaround time is less than two days. That's Safetiva Labs in Westfield. For more information, go to safetiva.com. 
The Vermont Cannabis Report is supported by another Green Mountain business, Canatrol, winner of High Times Best Dry Cure System. Check them out at canatrols.com.